I just got here about three minutes ago, and I don't know how I can top <laughs> what, what I just heard. So um, I spoke to this group, uh, I think it was five years ago, and gave an NCCN guideline update. Uh, I'm the chair of the NCCN uh, Prostate Cancer Treatment Guideline Panel. So this time I was asked uh, to talk on, there's, there's really four subjects here. So we're going to talk about one of my pet peeves is personalized medicine. Personalized medicine is not new. Physicians have been practicing personalized medicine for centuries. I like the term precision medicine, but I'm going to just address four areas where uh, we can do a better job of personalizing treatment for men with prostate cancer. Now, the reason this is important is that every two, man, every two minutes in America, somebody is told they have prostate cancer. And in spite of all the improvements we've made, there's still somebody dying every 18 minutes. So we need to pay attention. So we're going to talk about how to personalize the situation. And I think the biggest change in the last 10 years is the acceptance of active surveillance. And then we'll go ahead and talk about how you can personalize treatment better using the molecular biomarkers, prostate MRI. And then finally, I'm going to talk about really the biggest changes, uh, the treatment of advanced prostate cancer, and how both confusing and empowering it's become. So the whole active surveillance thing was touched off when various people estimated that you, you could either, the American study, there was no survival benefit at all to treating prostate cancer that was diagnosed when clinically localized and potentially curative. As the literature is matured, it appears that it's more like that you need to treat about 12 PSA-detected prostate cancers to save one life. That would meet the criteria for an effective treatment if you asked a governmental public health expert. And so I'm not exactly sure why we're having a big debate about whether to treat clinically localized prostate cancer, but a lot of the reason for it is we do know that we are over-treating many men. And the treatment appears less effective if you treat men who don't need to be treated at all. So we need to get this right. So the NCCN was very concerned about overtreatment of prostate cancer for a variety of reasons. And the main one is that, like, I, I'm 62, so I'm standing here. I have a 62% chance of having prostate cancer. And I still sleep at night. If you biopsy me for whatever reason, uh, you'll find that cancer with, with a likelihood of 50%. So I have a 31% chance if I was biopsies being told I have cancer. I only have a 4% chance of ever dying of prostate cancer. So you don't want to biopsy everyone who's 62. You don't want to treat everyone who's 62. But you do want to treat the ones that are destined to die of prostate cancer. So we have to pick out those four. So how do we do that? Well, we can use active surveillance. And the risk of placing a man on active surveillance with low-risk prostate cancer is that it is possible that their prostate cancer could spread while they're being watched. It could also grow so that maybe nerve preservation uh, wouldn't be possible, so you'd have to go see the previous speaker. You could also suffer from anxiety. A lot of men convert to treatment in America simply because they can't sleep at night because they've been told they have cancer. The benefit is obvious. If you don't have a treatment that causes side effects that you didn't need, that's a good thing. So we turned the world upside down in 2010 when we separated low risk into very low risk and low risk based on what the, your prostate cancer was like at the time of diagnosis. And this is what really engendered all the controversy, that for a low risk prostate cancer for man's physiologic life expectancy was less than 10 years, we said active surveillance should be the only recommendation. And if you had NCC in very low risk, that extended to 20 years. So you're now telling men in their late 50s with an NCC in very low risk prostate cancer that their only recommended treatment is no treatment. It's active surveillance and treatment only if there's evidence of growth of their prostate cancer. So the scare tactic is that your cancer will spread while you're being watched. Um, and uh, this all came about as a result of a paper published in the Canadian Journal of Urology, which was then disproven by a total of 
um, about seven well-done papers. So prostate cancer grows so slow that men who are subjective to active surveillance do not lose an opportunity for cure if they're one of the unlucky ones that proves that their prostate cancer needs to be treated. Now, can we do a better job of helping inform men about who needs to be treated and who doesn't among this about 50% of American men who are diagnosed with a low, uh, when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's low risk. So everyone is questioning now about molecular biomarkers. So this is excerpted from the NCCN 2015 guidelines. It has all the references to all of this, and I'm allowed to plagiarize myself because I wrote this. So um, I've also chopped this down. So the Institute of Medicine um, has created a roadmap for the development of a useful biomarker. They've suggested all these tests that have been met. And this is because Dan Hayes has warned everybody that a bad tumor marker is just as bad as a bad drug. If you have a test that tells you how aggressive your prostate cancer or your breast cancer is and it's wrong, that's just as bad as having an ineffective treatment. So we have to be very careful about the use of these biomarkers. So American men continue to select active surveillance only about 8% of the time, where it's estimated that about 40 or somewhere between 40 and 50% should undergo active surveillance. So it's possible that a good test could allay that anxiety and increase the number of men undergoing active surveillance when active surveillance is appropriate. So that test would have to provide information above and beyond your NCCN very low risk or low risk category. So there are, there are several of these tests now, and there are probably three that have the most literature behind them. And a year ago, this was probably true of two. Uh, Prolaris is a test that measures how fast your cells are growing, how fast your cancer cells are growing. It's a panel of 31 genes. The Oncotype DX test measures 17 different genes that come from four different pathways that are all thought to be associated with aggressive behavior. So both of these assays are great because they can be performed on a diagnostic biopsy most of the time. They can almost always be performed when you have a prostatectomy with all that tissue. And so these tests have been used to predict uh, the outcome of prostate cancer in many situations, and they're all listed there. But in essence, on the biopsy, it's used to try and distinguish aggressive from unaggressive prostate cancer. If you've had a radical prostatectomy, it's used to predict whether your treatment is curative or not. So all of these tests have been developed basically in the industry uh, space. There's been academic input into their development. But I want everyone to understand that they're marketed under a less rigorous FDA regulatory pathway than is used for drugs. So these assays have to be proved that they can measure something accurately, and they can measure it over and over again in the same sample. They don't have to prove that they have any utility for the management of patients. There is not money available to do clinical trials of does this drug separate good cancer from bad cancer. So the only way under our current system that these tests are going to be critically evaluated is by the marketplace. And these cost about 3,700 bucks a piece. So it's a lot of money. Right now, some insurers are paying for some of them in some situations. And so uh, we can also rely on comparative effectiveness research, which is studying men who've had these tests backwards and finding out if it looks like they did any good. So it's going to be quite a while before we understand whether these tests are really useful or not. All right, so the other big rage right now is prostate MRI. And prostate MRI used to be not so good, but now we've learned that we have to do it in a more sophisticated way. It's called a three-parameter 
MRI, and it requires a lot of computer analysis of the images to attempt to give an estimate of the likelihood of an aggressive prostate cancer being present. So this is possible because of improvement in MRI technology and improvement in our ability with the computer to handle complex images and make mathematical comp uh, calculations from those images. So what's nice about this is that the MRI can suggest the presence of an aggressive cancer. Two different companies can then marry those images with an ultrasound so that you can actually biopsy the area that appears suspicious. So this is called a fusion-guided um, truss biopsy. This has been developed largely by the group at the NCI. And what's nice about it is the very bottom of the slide here that in men in whom you don't know cancer is present, they have a very high detection rate if the cancer is aggressive, and they have a very low detection rate if it's not aggressive. So in other words, it has trouble seeing a prostate cancer that you don't need to find. It sees well an aggressive cancer. And so this is shown here that if you simply randomly biopsy the prostate in the little pale green, you see that the detection level, what it would be with just a truss-guided biopsy, where you're randomly sampling the prostate, if you do fusion MRI-guided biopsy, the detection rate of the moderate goes up a little bit, and the high-aggressive lesion goes way up. And the low-aggressive le low lesion doesn't change at all. So basically, it appears that this can't see well a uh, low low aggressive prostate cancer. So now the question is, can we take men who wish to do active surveillance and let them know that the safety of that choice is, is uh, higher? We, we, a lot of people believe that if you do an MRI, three parameter MRI, and it does not see aggressive cancer, that you're in good shape. So it's a test that you could use and if it's normal, then increase your confidence that active surveillance is a good thing. And in fact, it might even supplant the need for the follow-up biopsies that many urologists recommend. So MRI truss fusion guided biopsy will de de increase your detection of aggressive cancers. That's a good thing. And it will also fail to see the unaggressive cancers, which is a good thing because it addresses the overdetection problem. So we may be able to tell better who's right and wrong for active surveillance. All right, now here's the most interesting thing to me, and I think the most confusing thing to all of you. So this is a question. How is androgen deprivation therapy? Those things on the left are not chicken wings. Those are testicles. That's when we used to remove men's testicles is the form of hormonal therapy. So back when I was a resident, that's what we did. And I drove around in a car that looked like that, a Volkswagen. So the question is, how is ADT like a Volkswagen? The answer is, Volkswagen has evolved. Everything on that slide is a Volkswagen. And especially look at the upper left corner. That car sold only in Europe, but that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. And this is what's happened to ADT. We have all kinds of ways of getting rid of testicular androgens. So this has become quite confusing. So we have LHRH agonists, that's Lupron or Eligard or Zolodex that probably most of you are quite familiar with. Now we also have, instead of making the LHRH go away by overstimulating the pituitary, we can block the LHRH, and that's called the Garelix. We have antiandrogens, and I've listed there five of them, including one that's in clinical trials now. We have 5-alpha reductase inhibitors to prevent T from being testosterone from being turned into super testosterone, which is called dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. The newest on the market are the CYP17A1 inhibitors. The old one is ketoconazole that's very nonspecific, lots of side effects. 
And the new ones are listed below, and abiraterone is the one that probably all of you um, have heard about. So here's the problem. So listed in chronological order are the dates of FDA approval for docetaxel for chemotherapy, then CYP-T, Provenge, for immunotherapy, and then we have abiraterone, the new antiandrogen enzalutamide, six cycles of cab cabazitaxel, and RAD223. Now just look at the costs associated with this. If you had each one of them se sequentially, you'd, you or your estate would, would, would be hit with $532,000. And this is why in much of Europe, many of these weren't approved. But if you were lucky enough to respond in an average way to each one of the treatments, you'd add two years to your, to your life. Now, it's not quite this simple because many of them, if you don't respond to, if you respond to one, you won't respond to another, or you'll have side effects and can't tolerate one. But this is the goal, to turn advanced prostate cancer into a chronic disease, but it comes at a cost of side effects and the medications. And so you all know about CYP-T, that's the uh, Provenge um, uh, product. And uh, this is done, uh, is infusions at, uh, at two week intervals for three treatments. And here's the survival curve. And you can see that the extension of survival is about four months. And then uh, abiraterone's at the top with its two cousins below it. And here's the survival curve. Looks just like the last one. And then uh, here it is used uh, before uh, docetaxel. Survival curve looks like the other one. We now know that there are several mechanisms the tumors used to resist uh, the effect of abiraterone. And so there's a lot of disappointment because everybody thought abiraterone would be wonderful and it's not so good. So then we have the super anti-androgen enzalutamide. And you can see there the difference in, in, uh, in overall survival, again, is 18.4 versus 13.6. It's about five months. You can take cabazitaxel for chemotherapy after docetaxel has failed. And um, it, too, has an extension of survival of about two and a half months. There's the curve. You can take RAD223 if you have pain, painful bony metastases. And here's the survival curve. Get the theme? We got to do better than this. This is, a, this is all huge advances that I've shown you, but the advances are incremental, and we need to hit a home run. So don't worry about not having any health insurance, because I don't have any malpractice insurance. <laughs> this is my favorite thing for today. Patients have to recognize that you all make all the decisions, and you also take all the risk, and you've got to figure out everything I just talked about, because every patient is a person. And you can go through that whole smorgasbord of things that I just showed. Active surveillance, what, bi what biomarkers you want to use, do you want to involve MRI in your treatment or not, which of the ADTs do you want. And this should frustrate you, but it also should empower you because you have lots of different things to pick from, and you can pick the things that are right for you and your, and your family. This is the one thing I want to scare you with. So, at Roswell Park, over a two-year period, this is why you get a second opinion. We looked at 201 consecutive patients referred to us, and six of them did not have cancer. So that's an even better way to treat prostate cancer. You'll have higher cure rates if you treat 3% of your patients don't have cancer at all. So that's the absolute worst case of overtreatment. So you should always get a second opinion. And 10% of our patients had their um, risk category and treatment recommendation changed simply by having a GU pathologist look at their and assign their Gleason grade. Gleason grading is difficult to do. So, all right, so now we're supposed to have a discussion, right, Paul? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so if I can make some comments, Jim, about your excellent presentation. I'll look at active surveillance first and say Would you mind that if we join you up here? Would, would you mind if we join you? Oh, up? gosh, Come yeah, on. not okay. at all. Maybe I'm speaking out of turn. No, you're doing good. And then we're, then we're going to take questions. 
Are you, you coming so too? it's a counterintuitive concept, certainly, and yes. a difficult discussion to have with patients and their significant others, their family. But I think it has become now because human psyche adapts and more and more men have accepted this and it's being promulgated more widely that it is becoming more acceptable and, and patients will actually say when you mention the concept, they'll say, ah, I've read about it or heard about it somewhere. But I think we have to recognize that active surveillance is better than unnecessary therapy, but it's not a good thing in of itself. It would be better not to have done the biopsy and not know cancer is there. Why? Because you are then labeled as a cancer patient. Two, you then have the rigors of follow-up. You then have the cost, as was mentioned by Jim, of these various uh, genomic tests to determine a or to fine-tune the issue. So to have some tests pre-biopsy to eliminate the biopsy, thereby eliminating the unnecessary diagnosis, et cetera, would be, would be wonderful. With regard to MRI, I think it's uh, a wave of the future, but the Achilles heel is the expertise of the reader. I live in a rather sophisticated medical community, but the radiologists there are not focused, dedicated on prostate MRI. They read them but they don't read them like the folks at the NCI do who make it a profession and a focus to discern those very, uh, I'll say sometimes difficult shadows to delineate. I was disappointed that Jim didn't mention in the long laundry list of various therapies for, castrate, for metastatic prostate cancer, our old friend estrogen. It certainly can lower T. It has a bad name because of its cardiovascular side effects of old, but now we have a new way of delivering it transdermally rather than orally, and it bypasses the cardiovascular side effects that caused the overall survival decrement in the VA trials with estrogen. Although we have to remember from a prostate cancer specific survival benefit, estrogen actually was superior to orchiectomy. And fortunately, in the UK, they are testing in a large trial that's called the PATCH, P-A-T-C-H trial, transdermal estrogen versus traditional therapies. And why think of estrogen? Well, it eliminates the bone health problems that are associated with ADT otherwise. It will reduce and eliminate hot flashes it will, in some instances, improve REM sleep, thereby reduce fatigue, maybe thereby improve cognition. Those are all tantalizing thoughts, but estrogen, I think, is underutilized and underappreciated. With regard to the list of uh, therapies that Jim mentioned that equal to about a two and a half year survival benefit, I think maybe that can be extended by applying the therapies somewhat earlier in the course of metastatic castrate resistant disease. So in the trials, there are men with PSAs of hundreds, multiple of hundreds, as opposed to maybe PSAs of 20 or 30. And in, for instance, in the PROVENGE trial, if patients, and again, this is retrospective observation analysis, so it's not uh, written in clear-cut factual stone, but it's tantalizing to see that men with a PSA in the 20 to 25 range versus a 200 range had a much better survival versus the control arm, indicating that volume of disease, and, and, and that makes sense in my mind, volume of disease is better treated when it's low rather than significant. And lastly, pathology is subjective, and even the best pathologists vary on their thoughts. I had my pathology read by two experts, and it was different both with regard to pathologic stage and Gleason score. So again, I agree, you need to get a second opinion, 
but it's still a variable, and that's why some folks with Gleason 4 plus 5 do very well, maybe, versus someone who has a 3 plus 4 who you would say is, should do better uh, and doesn't. So it's, uh, again, it's a subjective art and may not always be as definitive as we'd like to have it when we put it into our nomograms to get a final equation or a percentage. But your presentation certainly was complete. <laughs> we wanted to make sure we had time for discussion. I think we're having some great discussion. We asked Jan to, uh, to be a reactor here as well. So as a non-physician and, and as a, uh, somebody who's been a caregiver for, for her husband, I wanted to just have you have an opportunity, ask some questions, uh, and have a little reaction time. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and again, as an advocate for my husband, for whatever reason, I seem to be that person who would come up with an objective question which got us a better answer. And I ended up being the driver of many of his treatment choices. Um, now, this was in a time before we had Provenge, then Zytiga, then Extandi. So everything we were doing was constantly thinking outside of the box. and. In the medical um, community, they'll call that off-label. And so that's always a tricky place to go. And as Dr. Shellhammer talked about estrogen, um, technically that's not only off-label, but it's off the charts a little bit. And so that makes it difficult for a patient to talk to his doctor or ask for it. Um, but I know that in my husband's case, um, there's mul multiple ways of administering estrogen. Certainly one is pills, which would be DES, maybe DES plus Coumadin, but that's very difficult to talk about because a lot of doctors won't touch it. But I will tell you that in our case, my husband had one of his best responses ever to DES plus Coumadin, which got his PSA all the way down to 0 0.022 after several other therapies, after, after Lupron and therapy was starting to go up. So can I, can I interrupt for please, a minute? Please, please interrupt. No, I don't need that. I have this. Okay. Um, the uh, DES, I'm, I'm old, like not quite, not quite, quite that old. But, but uh, we actually, we had our NCCN guideline uh, panel meeting. The first two-hour session was um, Tuesday, and the second one is Monday. And we had a big discussion of DES because the medical oncologists on the committee had proposed removing it from the guideline entirely. And the urologists and radiation oncologists were, were opposed. And so I'll be writing in the little section on the proper use of DES. The medical oncologists think that DES kills people because they just remember the five milligrams a day kills people part. But about 70% of men will be, will be rendered with the castrate testosterone level on one milligram a day that has no risk. And then you measure the testosterone. Some men need two milligrams a day. And only 3% of the population needs three. That's used orally. This is a good drug, and it's really cheap. And it has, as Paul appropriately pointed out, it had a, when used at a dose of one, two, three, where necessary, it is superior to orchiectomy. And it's thought by many that it has a sidal effect on cancer cells. Now, no one's ever proven that. Nobody really knows the mechanism for it. But this is an example of how you've got to go back and question everything, and you've got to find a smart doctor who knows all this stuff and, and try some of these things. So go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I, I Sorry would, for the interruption. D-E-S. It's an acronym for diethylstilbestrol. When it's I refer in, it, to it... Yeah, it's, syn ahead. it's synthetic estrogen. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And it needs to be gotten at a compounding pharmacy, no. which is tricky. No one will sell it anymore because of this perception that it causes heart attacks and strokes. Because when the VA did their study, they did five milligrams versus one versus um, orchiectomy. Oral. Either. You know, DES. DES is oral, but there are transdermal forms now patches. that are available again as, as patches. Um, they're, they're widely used in Europe, and they can be found, again, by independent pharmacies. Yeah, well, I mean, the difficulty is prescribing an adequate dose with the patch to depress T to castrate levels, because the third-party payers say, well, 
we only give one every three, one patch every three days because we're giving it for postmenopausal hot flashes right. in women. Whereas you might need two patches or three patches a day. It's again variable. You follow the T. So there's a lot of heartburn in getting it prescribed, but with enough persistence, you you can. And, and I know there is a risk. There's a shown risk of in men who take. Correct me if I'm wrong. Men who take oral estrogen, which means estrogen by pill, there is a risk of clot. Yeah, it's very small okay. until mm -hmm. you get to a five milligram In our dose. case, my husband took DES plus Coumadin, so that's how I always refer to it, because in my mind, the Coumadin was medically necessary with the DES. But I will always argue that every treatment decision is risk versus benefit between you and your doctor in the clinic. Mm -hmm. And we have standards, and we have systems, and we have... Um, you know, that we're supposed to follow and we need to follow, but everybody's different. So if you can have that risk versus benefit discussion with your doctor thoughtfully and well-researched, you can make great decisions together. So. And that's called personalized medicine. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. First of all, the biomarkers give us the opportunity to have better personalized medicine, and they have them available now throughout the disease state from who better to even biopsy through who better to treat with post-RP treatment. And a lot of them have Medicare coverage at this point, and they're going through the Molodex treatment. I mean, going through Molodex. So th the clinical utility has not only been established at some level, but it's being established more and more so as they're going. So yes, they haven't had the same clinical utility as, say, abiraterone or some of the other tests, but they, they are showing clinical utility and they're getting improved. And further, there's going are, to be more biomarkers. Are you from industry? I'm not. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. But I do, okay. think, I do think that biomarkers are very important and more and more answer the questions that the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force put out before us. So I think that, that we, we need biomarkers to improve outcomes for patients. And secondly... Let me, um, let me, that's one question. So let me comment on that, and then you can go to your second question. The, um, you are exactly correct. You said you believe that biomarkers will be helpful. In our NCCN guideline panel, there were people on the panel who expressed the opinion, now these are experts in prostate cancer, that these biomarkers are harmful, and they should not be mentioned in the guidelines. We're having a raging battle about this. So um, it is attractive to think that biomarkers help stratify risk better, but right now that has only been tested retrospectively. The studies need to be done to show that it does actually have clinical utility, which means that it changes treatment decision, and at this time they have not been done. So let's be clear, this is something that's new, and we're going to have to wait a little bit of time to see how they work out. Haven't there clinical utility studies been done with Oncotype DX, for example? Mm -hmm. Didn't they do clinical utility studies? No, they're, they're, they're doing retrospective, retrospective studies okay. where they take patients who have a known outcome, they go backwards and get their tissues, and they study it. That's different than taking a patient newly diagnosed with prostate cancer, doing the test, informing in, in, say, half the men in informing a treatment decision, the other half not doing the test, and then checking to see whether there's a difference in the way those men turn out. If, that would be establishing we, clinical utility. If we wait for a prospective clinical trial and biomarkers, we'll never have any biomarkers. The, first of all, the funding is never going to be that, available. That's exactly what I said. The marketplace is going to determine this, and we're going to have to rely on comparative effectiveness research. Which is but to sit here and say that bio, everyone should go out and get a biomarker now is inappropriate. But that's, you believe that to be true, but it's not, you, can't, you can't prove that. I don't so. think we can prove one way or the other, but I think that they're being used clinically in many, many, many urological practices for that purpose. That is absolutely true, and there may be more men being harmed by the use of the biomarkers than are being helped. We do not know at this moment. Would it still be a risk versus benefit decision between a patient and a doctor? Absolutely. Individually in the clinic? It is okay. an individual patient's right to re re request these tests, and uh, what they're doing it, believing that they'll be helpful. That's the point I'm making. Believing that they'll be helpful, we do not know that they're helpful. 
We will know 10 or 15 years from now, and that will not be in time to help the people who need help now. And that's the unfortunate situation we're in. Yes, and sir. I think Can you get the... I did. The other question I had was about the, the treatment options for advanced prostate cancer. And mo aren't most of those available in Europe and have gone through the NICE guidelines? I think all of them except for Provenge. So for the cost and benefit analysis. So I, Abby. I, I, don't think, I don't think enzalutamide has passed the, the NICE, the UK, the National Health uh, Insurance hurdle, abiraterone. Just has, is. just has. Mm -hmm. And then you have to make the distinction between pre and post docetaxel. And I, I'm not sure that. Only post. Only post with abiraterone. So it, it's kind of a yes, yes and no answer. But it, 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 it is Dr. meeting Sh some hurdles. Dr. Shellhammer, at the AUA, wasn't uh, some data released about treatment overlay and treatment sequencing earlier in the disease state for some of those? which increased survival? Oh, my question was at the AUA just in the past May. Wasn't, I think, I believe data was released at the AUA that talked about some of those advanced treatment options being provided earlier in the disease state to extend life as well. I, I, to me, that make the, the retrospective analysis of most of these trials, breaking patients into quartiles, usually by PSA, show that you get a better outcome with lesser disease burden. I mean, that might mean that the patient has a better performance status, which automatically says patients are gonna do better. So it's a little bit dif difficult to say absolutely and certainly that that's the case, but it seems to be. And to me, if someone is, has castrate-resistant prostate cancer, we'll say with PSA of 30 and two bone lesions or three versus a PSA of 400 with 12 bone lesions, whatever therapy you're going to deliver is going to have a greater impact over time, excluding lead time bias, which has to be factored in, which is a tough one to, to, to ascertain, they're going to do better. Why? Because the cancer has fewer mutations. It's lesser on the way to having adapted to becoming more resistant. Is, is the M I was is the to prostate MRI, MRI available around the country is just specialized clinics. And I don't quite understand when the drug like pro, the drug, the Provenge type drug, you said it gives four more months of survival. Is that a good, good four months or a crappy four months? Yeah, so Provenge has very few side effects. It causes many men to feel like they have the, the flu when they get it. Uh, it's quite safe. Yeah, but how about the, the four months that you got to live longer. Are they good? A good That's four what months. I'm it has very few side effects. Okay. And so yes, it's a good. It's a good four months. And how about the MRI? Is that available so, throughout the country? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Shellhammer spoke to that. Um, MRI, like at our facility, we have two MRI prostate specialists. So the quality of MRI you get at our place will be very different than out in the community. Many community. MRI facilities don't have a three Tesla magnet. Uh, therefore, they have to use an endorectal coil to make their 1.5 Tesla magnet perform adequately. Um, they also don't have the sophisticated software packages necessary to analyze the images. So this is uh, just like anything else. You, you, you have to be informed. You have to ask the right questions. You always have to query your physician, no matter if it's a radiation oncologist, uh, urologist wanting to take your prostate out, or an MRI person wanting to image your prostate, well, how many do you do? What's your training? And if they say, I don't know, you should go somewhere else. I'd like to address that question if I could. I think Dr. Faye Stern from Admitech is the one who has driven the research for prostate MRI. And she has some what she calls it, the International Prostate MRI Working Group. And on, on that list, she has um, a list of radiologists in the United States and even in Europe that are, I don't think she's comfortable calling them experts, but the reality is we have names that we could share with you of um, certainly NCI and then there's Claire Tempany at, at, in Boston and, and there's quite a few others that might be, of, of, might be helpful. 
Yeah, the, um, the expertise in MRI is developing rapidly, and I think you can be pretty confident that if you go to any uh, NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center, especially any NCCN member institution, you're going to have high quality. Now, there will be high quality outside of those centers, and you just have to ask the right questions. Regarding prostate MRI, which I think is really important, especially with the re release of PIRADS in December of last year from the American College of Radiology, which means that prostate cancer is now the third cancer to have any RADs, which are a standardized way of reading the imaging. First came BIRADS for breast cancer, then came LIRADS for lung cancer. Now we have PIRADS for prostate MRI. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of things, just to clarify the message for maybe some of the support group leaders. I know you made re reference to um, three parameters used in the MRI. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we call that multi-parametric. Mm -hmm. So that I was thinking they might have got that mixed up with three Tesla, which is the strength of the magnet, the strength of the MRI. Right. Multi-parameter yeah. requires three. Two's not enough. It has to be done with all three. So multi-parameter yeah. has to be three-parameter MRI. So that means multi-parametric MRI in our terminology, probably in the prostate cancer community. Um, and you made reference to finding aggressive cancer and non-aggressive cancer. And the PIRAD score that you would get on your MRI report would give you a score of one through five. And they use the term clinically significant. And for best explanation, it's probably fair to say that clinically insignificant would be Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable saying that? Mm -hmm. So that clarifies it, I think, for prostate cancer patients, which speaks to the fact that Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6 is probably the least aggressive type cancer, and that sometimes is a little misinformation. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the uh, pathology, the American Academy of Pathology um, convened a meeting in Chicago that occurred about uh, three months ago. And all the experts in urologic pathology there uh, will be issuing a revised um, scoring system. Pathologists will still report the Gleason score as everyone's used to, which is the primary pattern plus the secondary pattern equals the score. Um, but Gleason 3 plus 3 will now be number 1. Uh, 3 plus 4 will be 2. 4 plus 3 will be 3. Uh, 4 plus 4 will be 5. And then 9 and 10 uh, will be 4. 9 and 10 will be 5. Patients struggled with the fact that they were being told they had a Gleason score 6 on a scale of 2 to 10, and it's not worth worrying about. So now it's going to be 1 through 5. This will be reported separately, and I can't remember exactly what they're calling it, but this, is, um, this will clarify things for patients. So 1 will be the low-risk prostate cancer, and then two will be the uh, favorable intermediate. It'll, and those are the candidates for active surveillance. So it's going to be much, it's going to be conceptually the way you would think about it. This may already be on the Johns Hopkins website. Is this what Dr. Epstein has been proposing for a while? Yeah, he sure. proposed it about three years ago, and he's finally convinced everyone I think to, it's already on their website, and that yes, could be it helpful. Is. It has yeah, been for quite patients. some time. And when should we be looking for this? Uh, the, the, the paper is supposed to come out in about another month. Okay. So this is something for all of you to keep, keep uh, your antenna up about over here. My question was about what you're talking about now, about staging. Uh, we hear much about, and this came from somebody in my group, we hear much about uh, staging when, you know, cancer is diagnosed. Uh, what about when cancer returns after a period of time where it's been in remission and it comes back? Is there, is there a staging number there or not? Uh, you know, is it, is it three, four, or five? No. If it, well, if, I mean, if, if it comes back after surgery, it's called a biochemical failure until an imaging test reveals that it's metastatic, in which case it's four. So there's, there's no, and, and there's some uh, discussion about post-radiation therapy biopsies and whether they can be graded according to the Gleason system. And there's dispute among pathologists as to whether you really can do that. So once someone has their official initial stage, subsequent to that, they fail first by a PSA hmm. reading, and that's biochemical failure, and that's kind of one box, and after that, it's imaging failure, and that makes them metastatic. 
I think that was a question that he was trying to get answered because it had debilitated him to the point that he was trying to get disability. And that's why I was asking the question, you know, I think uh, in order to get disability, you have to be a stage four. Uh, is that right? Am I? Yeah, so this is very confusing because yeah. there's the AJCC system that is the Roman numeral one, two, three, four. Right. And then we all use the TNM system, which mm -hmm. is the T, the tumor stage, the N, right. the nodal stage, and the M, the MET stage. It's further confusing because people confuse the Gleason score mm -hmm. with the stage. Right. The Gleason score is how aggressive is your cancer. Your stage is how much of it do I have. Right. And then what's further confusing is that your stage is your stage is your stage. It never changes, mm -hmm. technically. But when you progress, we all, like at our place, will have an M0 when you're initially diagnosed, no evidence of metastasis, mm -hmm. and then we'll draw an arrow to M1B when you develop bone mets. So your stage kind of has changed, but right. your official staging, like in all the tumor registries, mm -hmm. is still that original M0. I see. So you yeah. can see how, how people get confused about this. Right. And that was a, I know you're not a social security expert, so that, that was a question I couldn't answer either. But, you know, he had to hear it from his doctor. So, yeah. you know, that, I thought that was a viable question. So. Excellent Thank question, you. excellent question. Okay, in terms of determining uh, how aggressive uh, one's prostate cancer is, how, are there any studies that, that, that indicate that certain ethnic groups have a more aggressive form of cancer than others? Yeah, so in general, um, African Americans are, are diagnosed with prostate cancer more often, and when they're diagnosed, they're 1.4 times more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, and when they are diagnosed with prostate cancer, the mortality rate is 2.3 fold higher. The opposite is true for Asians, uh, perhaps not when they've been in the United States for the, to the third generation, then it becomes the same as Caucasian Americans. Um, the reasons for the racial differences in prostate cancer incidence and mortality are the subject of much of my research life. So, um, I run the North Carolina-Louisiana Prostate Cancer Project, which is the largest population-based research study ever done of men with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. And we're in year about 15 now. And um, we are trying to compartmentalize the reasons for these racial differences in mortality into the differences in the interaction of men with the American healthcare system the biology of the man who has cancer, and the biology of their cancers. And all I can do is tell you this is incredibly complicated, but I think most of it is in the first bucket. And we have a whole series of papers that if you just Google me, you can go read all you want. We have, I think we're up to 27 papers now, and we have 17 funded grants interrogating this biorepository. There are lots of other people looking at this, and it is clear there are many differences between what we, you know, what we call an African American and a Caucasian American. I will argue there's a continuum here because we've genotyped everybody and it's not so simple. Um, but uh, there's, there's lots of differences, but I don't think anybody can tell you that there's one or two or even three things that if we addressed, we would get rid of this racial disparity. Do you have any idea if the African-Americans uh, have a different disposition to this than persons who are, are in Africa, black people in Africa, or who might have more recently arrived in the United States, as you can determine with Asians. Yeah, so there are two or three academic medical centers in the United States that have projects going on comparing Africans to African-Americans where they have clinical, they have, uh, clinical studies, population-based studies, enrolling um, African Americans in Africa and African Americans in America and looking exactly that question. And uh, to my knowledge, there's, there's, there's nothing 
yet um, noteworthy in those studies, but they're ongoing. There's three of these huge studies. There's also a huge study going on between the University of California, San Francisco, and many centers in Asia to look at this strange situation where Asians have a very much reduced incidence of prostate cancer. They move to America, and by the second generation, it's the same as Americans. You want to add anything else? No, that's, okay. that's got it. Uh, uh, regarding Sono has... Uh, go over here in the corner. Regarding Sono has metastatic prostate cancer, and uh, looking at the uh, determining if treatment is effective, can you tell us what your opinion is of circulating tumor cell test prostate? Well, it, it's a very uh, promising and enticing possibility for the future, but there are different ways of segregating the cells and testing them, and right now it's not mainstream. It, it's a hopeful uh, avenue of uh, investigation. I mean, you can initially just look at numbers of cells and discriminate. It happens to be five, and, and it was, that was worked out through retrospective analyses. Greater or less than five would de demarcate a group of individuals with greater or less uh, survival prospects. But the more important, I think, uh, possibilities are actually selecting the cells and, and looking at their biomarkers, their genome, their potential uh, susceptibility to, we'll say, personalized or precision medicine. But that's futuristic and, and not currently clinically applicable. So the, the circulating tumor cells are part of the NCCN guidelines is a biomarker for response in men who are receiving docetaxel. And if you have uh, more than five and then you begin docetaxel after the second course of chemotherapy, if you still have more than five, it's fairly prognostic of you're not responding. But you heard me just say fairly prognostic. So we have had, we just had the discussion on Tuesday about whether the CTC should be entered into the algorithms is a biomarker of response, or in this case, it's a biomarker of non-response. And the best medical oncologist in the, in the United States said no. So this is another test. The CTCs are, there's about eight different platforms to measure them. Um, it's very controversial about how to measure them. And it's another area where we need more progress before you could hang your hat on it as a biomarker of response or non-response. All right, thank you. So can I follow up real quick to that, just for the audience? Docetaxel is the generic name for taxotere chemotherapy. Yeah. And Dr. Schellheimer, I have a question for you, if you don't mind, because I understand a little bit behind this question. Sometimes men to get to a point where they're advanced and their PSA, and by the way, PSA was never meant to be perfect. It was always meant to be understood. That's my, that's my viewpoint. Um, but I'm from the institute where it was discovered. Anyway, my so, question is... Uh, <laughs> but, but sometimes you need a, an additional marker. Do you ever still use an LDH to support a PSA? It's a simple blood marker. It's an older one. Do you ever use that still, LDH? In, in men with castrate-resistant metastatic cancer, I obtain it. But, and as I also get an alkaline phosphatase. Alpha but yeah. but, but it, it, is an, it's, it tells me that the disease is progressing and the volume of disease is increasing. It, it really, again, is a, not, not anything to make any decisions on, clearly. But it could be helpful. It could, it could and, be, but my it usually adds is, on to what you uh, already are. You, you brought up DES, and besides what Suzanne Summers has to say, is there any difference that you know of between the synthetic and the bio, what they call bio, uh, the hormones that are what, bio? Uh, Bioidentical? Bio, I think you call them bioidentical hormones compared to the synthetic. And have you seen any reports? I know Suzanne Summers wrote two books on it. Wow. But she, she must know more than anybody else. Not familiar. Okay, maybe one more. One more. I, I, Ivy back here. I didn't hear it. 
yeah. significant life expectancy right, so, based on right. that. The right. She asked trial about findings. the charted trial, and Paul and I were just talking about it and stampede in the back of the room. Uh, the charted trial basically shows that there's about a two-year um, extension in survival when uh, chemotherapy is initiated at the time of androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, this has the potential to trans be a transformative event in how we treat advanced prostate cancer. Uh, the charted trial has still not been published, and so it hasn't yet uh, met the scrutiny of, of seeing the publication. Therefore, we introduced Taxotere as an option in this space a year ago in the NCCN guidelines in the algorithms. There is nothing in the manuscript section because we do not put anything there to explain the algorithm until the paper's published. It's supposed to be, I can't say what journal, it's going to be out in, a, in two to four weeks. Like New England journal, yes. But t tell me, Jim, did you make any qualifiers as to extent of disease as a necessity or as a requirement for your recommendation? Because right. the so, paper says four or more right. vertebr uh, osseous metastases right. and not soft tissue metastases. Right. So this is where you get into the finer points of things. So the FDA approval that was issued for, um, for a dose of ta taxotere and ADT pertained only to people with high volume disease. And you had to have four or more metastases, bone metastases, or you had to have visceral metastases. The Stampede trial is a much larger trial. It's being conducted in Europe. It was presented at ASCO two weeks ago. It will not be published for a little while yet. Uh, but it shows that the, it, oh, in the, um, in the uh, charted trial, there was no benefit seen in the low volume prostate cancer patients to giving chemotherapy. This was also the case in a trial performed in Europe. The Stampede trial is bigger than both trials I just mentioned combined. Um, it's a rolling trial, so it's harder to understand. Um, arms keep coming into it as new drugs come out. But everybody's very excited about it because the extension of survival occurred in both the high volume and the low volume group. And the extension of survival seen in the high volume group in charted was confirmed in both groups. So it's, I, we really shouldn't even be talking about it because neither study is published. And a lot of times we talk about stuff. And then when the publication comes out, ooh, it's different. So, but I do think your, your question is very appropriate. And I think there's going to be a, a game changer coming here where, especially for younger men, healthier men, I'm, stay, I'm saying physiologically younger, where taxotere would be very well tolerated. I myself, if I had bone metastatic disease diagnosed tomorrow, I'd take ADT and I'd take six doses of taxotere. Now, if I was 85, you know, um, maybe not. So again, we're going to have to, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about this. We need to see the publication. This is ex these are the exciting things that are on the horizon, correct? Yes. Can I yes. clear up just real quick? Sure. You said visceral metastases. That yeah. means soft tissue, correct? No. It means a, a metastasis to the liver is basically to what... the liver? Well, not, not only the liver, but Lung? that's typically where it goes. Okay. Lung, yes. And second, Lung the charted liver. trial and stampede trial, what's so different about them is they were talking about giving tax taxotere to men who are newly diagnosed, not recurrent, right. and metastatic. So that's why it's so different. Correct. So we have a lot of excitement here. Um, let's wrap this up. And before we thank the, the panelists, um, I want to emphasize we have a trip for you to hang with the guys in Bahamas. So think about the raffle. No to the board members. You can't, or staff. You can't buy tickets. But please. Um, you Seize your opportunity home. to win a You're trip to the Bahamas. Yeah. Um, now, let's thank everybody on the panel. I sure appreciate what you guys had to say.